Well, thanks for having me again, Donna. This has been great. And so nice to meet so many of my cohorts and uh, the crime of trying to paint a nose correctly. Uh, it's one of those things, the hardest part about a portrait painting is a painting where something's wrong with the nose. I think it was the best description ever created of a portrait painter. Today, we're gonna to be working on a very limited palette. I'll talk a little bit about everything else and how I approach a painting. Usually there are two approaches to a painting. One is to paint a la prima, which is the one where we just paint all at once. Uh, when painting all at once, it's very intimidating. And so I'll be doing some of that today where I'm painting all at once, but the, I guess what I should say, the goal is to create an underpainting that we can then use to, for our final painting on top. Uh, one thing I will show, that, what's that, I'm sorry? Was there a question there? Did somebody ask a question? I didn't. Okay, just, I'll keep going then. Yeah, just keep going. Okay, uh, the colors that we're primarily using today, there's any number of limited palettes. Uh, Anders Zorn painted uh, very famously with white, a yellow ochre, cadmium red light, what we would use now, he would uh, call it vermilion at the time, and then ivory black. Those four colors paint really well, and especially skin tones. They all stay towards the warm side of the skin tone, so they do really well for that. Today, I'm gonna to paint with primarily white and yellow ochre again. Those are great skin tones. I'm gonna to use a transparent oxide red. Some of you might be using burnt sienna. That's fine too. Uh, it's a nice earthy, reddish, earthy color. And then we can paint with ivory black or I prefer to cool those warm colors with uh, blue, such as an ultramarine blue. Ultramarine blue, is probably the best blue to paint with so many other colors. As I say, it mixes well or plays well with friends. It plays well with all the other colors. It's because it's a slightly warm blue already and it doesn't have a super strong tinting strength. So that helps it out completely. There's one other blue that I often paint. I'll give a demonstration with today. Also is Prussian blue. Prussian blue is a very cool blue. And when you're looking at it, it looks very much like a phthalo blue. Uh, chromatically, they're very close to the same color, but chemically they're not. And the way they mix with others is different too. Uh, phthalo blue is a very, very strong tinting blue. And I try to avoid it unless I'm just painting a blue sky and want it touching nothing else. Otherwise <laughs> it goes a little, goes a long way and never quits going either. Uh, but a phthalo, uh, Prussian blue has a beautiful clear blue color. When you mix it with white, it makes a beautiful blue, a very naturalistic blue. It comes across almost looking like a cerulean blue, depending on the brand. It's always about the brand, but those colors mix well. So in this underpainting here, if you guys can see this, this is an underpainting that I did using white, yellow ochre, uh, transparent oxide red, and nothing more than raw umber. And this is kind of here in this camera, you're probably seeing it looks a little dark. I promise it's not as dark as black. The darkest dark right up here in the hair, if we measured it on a value scale, would probably be somewhere around eight. Um, you know, I'm not, excuse me, around two. It's not going to be the darkest dark you can get. It's really not. Uh, and I purposely leave my underpaintings. If, you are, if your goal is to create underpainting today, I would always leave the underpainting higher and finished than it needs to be in your final. It's because when we paint those other layers on it later, after it's dry, we want to tint those colors or put any colors on top of it. Just like in watercolor, your translucent, transparent colors are going to bring that value down. And you'll end up with way too dark a painting if you're not careful. It takes a little practice, but it's always safe, especially for an underpainting, to keep your values higher than you want them to be in the final painting. We're going to think of this as a foundation color to build upon. Here's another one, and this is the finished version of this color or this painting that we're gonna to do today. And uh, I've done a number of them to show you at different stages. Now this particular painting was painted with the limited palette of white, yellow ochre, transparent oxide red, and Prussian blue. So the Prussian blue gives it a little of that green cast. It makes it really pretty. It's a beautiful naturalistic 
almost uh, olive green when it mixes together there. Here you'll see the same painting in a earlier stage. And if we get to this stage today, I will consider this a good stage. Only because when it comes to getting things finished, I prefer to leave as much as possible a lot of those little uh, happy accidents, as we call them, in the beginning stages. It leaves some of that spontaneous effect, but not always. As I showed you earlier with our pirate, I, he is a completed underpainting, and he is using black as my uh, cool gray here. You can't really get much more than that, and maybe even a, a ochre. One other painting I have here for you also on a very limited palette would be the really three colors. Uh, it's white, yellow ochre, transparent oxide red, and then blue again, ultramarine blue. And it seems dark here in the camera, and I'll see if I can adjust that for you guys later. But overall, you can see those four colors were able to create. And this was done as an a la prima completely start to finish it in class is about three little over three hours completely for this particular painting. Wow. So uh, Arnold has always been, he's easy to paint, especially when you're painting those hooded eyelids, not much detail. I'm going to attempt to paint this young lady. And as I've told you before, the hardest thing in the world to paint are beautiful young women and babies simply because the nuances of those subtle variations of value can really change things very quickly. So let me turn on our camera here and we'll get started. Oh, sorry guys, I was hoping we could get a really nice close up, but that didn't happen. So we'll do this the best we can. So starting with nothing more than if we have our, our reference material and what we're gonna see here, as I have on my screen particularly, this is something I would share with my students. Thinking about keeping uh, shapes as simple as possible. If we were painting, and if you can draw this really, really small, if you think of it as something really small, you see nothing but shapes. And it can make everything simpler. If you wear glasses, I always tell my students, if you wear glasses, take your glasses off. You can't see anything but shapes anyway, right? It works perfectly that way. So if we look over here for the shadows, I really have this broken down into four major value changes. We have the darks, the super darks, which we're calling shadow. No detail at all in the shadow. We're having the half tone. Now you have a darker half tone and a lighter half tone, and then you have the broad light. The broad light was really, if you think of it, dark and light, those are the two major rules. And what we're thinking of primarily is whatever is in the light has volume and has detail, whatever's in the shadow loses detail. If you'll just keep it that simple in your concepts in the beginning, it makes it easier to kind of squint and see. I'm gonna do nothing more than quick uh, measuring with the eye primarily in my approach to this painting. Let me pull my brushes over here so I can have these as well. Get rid of my camera out of the way there and turn that off. Okay, so now, when it comes to this, I've already oiled it. I've put a thin layer of oil onto the canvas surface itself. It's already been toned. That was done oh, probably Monday or Tuesday. And I didn't do anything fancy about it. There was not perfectly smooth. I wasn't really caring. I just wanted some sort of tone on there. And then I've already wiped the oil off. So it's just a very thin micron of oil, which allow me to almost paint and erase if I wish to. And depending whatever your favorite brush is, I like this nice little filbert. It works well for everything. It's, a, it's almost like a basic sketching brush or sketching tool for me. I'm gonna use a little bit of walnut oil, nothing more. Uh, remember our paint already has a medium in it. I don't need much medium at this stage. Painting with the rules of oil, we paint fat over lean. So our first initial layers are gonna be very thin very lean. And by painting that way allows me to make adjustments and sketches very easily. I've just got some raw umber here and I can use just raw umber if I wish. When it comes to laying the image out for me, I'm going to first primarily try to concentrate on where the image is going to be. So the eyes always a focal point. I'll just use that. And if I go from corner of the eye to corner of the eye and I want to emulate that angle, whatever that angle is going to be. 
I can do the same thing here in my reference, or if I were watching someone across the room, I would adjust my angle of the brush until it meets what I see. And then I would hold on to that angle. I can come right over here, and then I'm just gonna slowly bring that across until that angle is about the same as I see it. And that counts from corner of the eye to corner of the eye. Once I have something like this, I can kind of start seeing where I wanna place things. If I just basically place the eye here, and then the eyebrow comes up here. I'm just eyeing, nothing more than that measuring. If I see where the top of the eyebrow comes to here, it's gonna to touch the eye there. I'm just making little tick marks. This is something we all do to a certain extent very early. We learn this stage very early. I'm just gonna lay out approximately where values are going to go and where the composition is. The important part right now is just getting the composition laid out so it'll fit. See that angle there? So it'll fit on my canvas. If I bring this angle down from the corner of an eye to the tip of her nose, one of the methods for painting a portrait is to get that magic triangle. And there's two different ways to do it. You can do from the corner of the eye to the tip of the nose, and then from the corner of the eye to the middle of the chin. And those two triangles will give you a very symmetrical face. And even if it's working at three quarter view or any other view, it always works pretty well. So in this case, if I bring the center of the chin and just go up, it's gonna line up almost with this. So I know it's gonna do that. And then if it comes here from the corner to the center of the chin and I find that angle and that's a good angle and I bring that angle over, I know that it's going to meet right about there. There's always gonna be some adjustment, but it works really well. I do the same thing now with the corner of this eye here to the center and I get another triangle And it's again, right about here. So I'm just gonna adjust a little bit. That's gonna be pretty well. Now I'm just gonna look for the chin at that angle. I'll just start filling things out until my little drawing matches up where it's supposed to be. Where is that gonna line up at? That's gonna line up almost over here, okay. And if I use nothing more than a squint and my darkest colors, I'm gonna put a little bit of warmth in here now. I can use, when I squint, I can use these big dark patterns as my guide for if it's balanced enough. somebody.
and then adjust. <laughs> As I said, the first paint brush is always, the paint stroke is always the best. Everything after that is an adjustment. <laughs> Also, I guess I should say I am painting on a uh, oil primed surface. Some of you are probably working on an acrylic prime surface. And if you're working on an acrylic prime surface, you notice pretty quick, it starts feeling like it's drying up. That's great and hard, it just depends. I like my paint to slide around. It's just a personal preference. Everybody will eventually find the thing that works best for them.
One thing I was telling my students the other day who were watching me finish up the rest of the little gnome painting that we had been working on is about keeping your brush dry so it doesn't get too soppy wet at the same time as well. Then you can use it in this case, I'm gonna use it a little like an eraser too. If you're painting a true grisaille, and, but you still like those warm undertones, if you'll just use or do your underpainting in a monochromatic painting of uh, raw umber and white, it makes a beautiful, slightly warm gray, which makes for a real almost sepia tone kind of quality for an underpainting. And if you know you're gonna do only as an underpainting, it might make it simpler for color and value. You're really concentrating on your value more than you're concentrating on color. It's done. Dinner's ready. Sorry. <laughs> so much, so much I'm, as long as you're caring, we don't care. <laughs> it's pretty loud. It's another room. Multitasking. It, we all do that. It's the teacher's nightmare. <laughs> I don't know if any of you are following my Instagram or whatever, uh, but I did a demonstration in class the other day of a blaster. So I did, started it in class and I finished it yesterday as a uh, blaster, which I'll share with my students, some of which are here with us today. I think Ben and Heng Lee, they get to see the blaster in class on Tuesday. Is it okay if people want to ask questions, Mike? Absolutely. Just I'm used to it, so yes, feel free. If, if anybody wants to have a question, just put it in chat. Yeah, I won't be able to see it, so just someone well, will... we'll, we'll read it to you. Okay, thanks. <laughs> I first, I did my first little dip into the yellow ochre. I use yellow ochre just like I would uh, white to brighten the value of the paint, but without really bringing white into what I call pollute my uh, color. White will kill, I think, any of that vibrancy very early.
I'm going to try. There's a number of ways to do it. I'm going to start laying in some background color here. I will use a little bit of liquid. It will help make the paint flow. I'm going to use, there's two ways to do it. I'll do one on one side and one on the other, just so you can see what it does to color. Uh, so let's use this transparent oxide red and a little bit of Prussian blue. Just so you can see what it does to the color. On this side here will be the Prussian blue and transparent oxide red. So it's still very orange. I can lean it now very easily towards the green side as I call it, because it does give it a nice, beautiful, earthy, almost uh, olive green, but very rich. And I'm keeping it very transparent at this point, just kind of working my way into edges. And then I'll clean my brush and then I'll go on the other side with yellow ochre and black so you can see what it looks like too. It'll still give a green, but it'll be a deader green. Chromatically, they look pretty similar, but one is automatically going to be more opaque. And it also gives me a really good judge on my values right away. Hmm. I think a little bit of yellow ochre, more so. I'll get this pretty locked in. And remember, I don't mind letting my edges get lost a little bit as long as I can find them again. Are you using liquid in that, in your mixture? Barely any, barely. Yeah, I try to keep the paint. It's got enough oil and my surface being an oil ground is a little slippery anyway, so I don't need much. If you're on a surface such as acrylic uh, primer that has a lot of pumice in it, it seems to soak it up pretty quick. Then you might want something uh, you might need to add some sort of medium to it just to make the paint flow a little bit more from time to time. But I want to avoid that as much as possible because I want it to be fairly stiff for the most part. Now I'm going to start working on that, whatever this value is. And I want to keep my values, remember, a little bit higher because I'm going to use it as an underpainting than I would for the final finish if it were to be an all a primo approach. So I'm going to Take my mineral, in this case, I've got my transparent oxide red. I'm gonna add a little bit of blue to it just to kill it. And I'll start establishing just those shadows a little bit more. Just painting the patterns of the shadows. And because I'm painting skin, I always prefer keeping everything a little on the warm side. 
as opposed to the cool side. Because it's always easier in that final glaze to make things cooler. But man, you get a dead eye that's really black or gray or then it just, you know, the little little thin transparents of the eyelids themselves, if they become black or the nostrils ever become black, they look like she's been sniffing coal dust or something like that. So uh, artificially, any darks in the face, I always make warm. Never do I make cool. Always make warm. And if you look at some of the English painters, or if you look at, I'm looking right now at a painting over here of Hell series, even when he's doing an egg temper, all those nostrils are almost red. They have an almost red kind of quality about it. As long as you bring the value down, it'll read just as much as it needs to. It's more about value. And you'll really notice that in these, the painting we're doing today, if we get these values correct, she'll have a three-dimensional quality all about her. Again, whatever I do on one side, I try to do on the other to make sure my symmetry stays the same. The eyes are looking a little wonky to me already. I think I'm in a little too much of a hurry. Even when I'm painting my uh, portraits in uh, finished portraits, I prefer to paint this kind of from life with mistakes and all. I have to fix everything. And I, I don't know, maybe it's, it's the same thing I teach to my digital students. I like, it, it's something about the fixing where you're covering over and creating, you know, you're covering over and fixing your mistakes you get these small little blends that you would never get if you copied or traced the drawing over. And I don't know what that is about it. It's, it's something about painting it over and painting it out and painting it over and painting it out. You get these subtle little blends. If you guys know David LaFell's work at all, uh, David's an incredible painter and hard teacher, really hard teacher, because he's always talking like ad nerdum in these kind of... Uh, esoteric qualities about his painting and what he's doing. And you're thinking that's not a technique. That's something thinking. And I think we all as artists know, there's a certain part where the intuition takes over uh, the objective part of us telling that's right or that's wrong, but it's how we get there is always slightly different. And the fell almost always works. Like he's, he's, he's seeing in the dark and then all of a sudden, little by little by little by little things start coming into the light. He's almost sculpting so many of his paintings. The best teacher at explaining that I've ever come across, I think I've said this before, uh, as a portrait artist was uh, Daniel Green. Daniel was such a craftsman, but also such a, a, a linguist. He was so good at saying exactly what he was doing at the very time he was doing it. A very analytical approach.
And if you ever paint with Morgan Weasling, who's a, a former illustrator. So in many of his early career paintings would, you know, uh, get the uh, drawing approved. It had to be approved through a client, everything else. And then he would just transfer the drawing to the canvas. But his fine art approach is much more little at a time, little at a time, get the big masses in, get the little masses. And then he blends color almost like laying tile, little pieces and nuances of value changes, very little blending. And so there's not a right way or wrong way is what works for you or what is your uh, aesthetic that you really appreciate. I'm working with this fairly big brush. Again, it's just easier to sculpt with, I think, in the beginning. I've got a question, Mike. Sure. Melissa and Carrollton said, what's a tip on a commission portrait if you're stuck and can't get a likeness? <laughs> <laughs> That's always the hard part. And sometimes when you say a likeness, it, everybody else would recognize it, but it might be the subtle way the mouth, uh, that little twinkle in the eyes is such small nuances. One of the things that's always helped, and maybe some of you have heard of the use of black glass. You know what black glass is? It's something they would all use in the old days. Now we just, we all have it on our phones. You can hold your phone up at a certain angle and you, it takes the values away really quickly. And because you're looking at it as a reflection, a slightly different view, it makes it easier to see. In uh, my old studio, I have a big mirror that hangs right behind me so I can just do this. I turn around and look at it and I'm seeing the painting in reflection. That more than anything, you'll notice automatically. Parts of the head are too narrow. Parts of the head are too wide. You see if the angle of the eyes is correct. It's simply because you're looking at it from a completely unique new angle. I'm looking at this now, her in this uh, video monitor when I'm looking at it too. Of course, it's a skewed angle as well, but it gives me a completely new look at the same time. So I can always judge, especially since I have these other three paintings or uh, photographs of her to look at. I can kind of judge it by that as well. One of the things I could tell right now is I just, you know, she'll have that little, little thing right there, cheek uh, turn that needs to happen eventually also. Uh, but when it get, it's getting that likeness, purport, it's always about proportions. When you think about it, when we see a friend walking towards us at the park and they're hundred yards away, 50 yards away, 30 yards away, we know who they are instantaneously. It's not the detail. It's all the structure for a license. It's all, I mean, that likeness It's always, did I get the proportions between the eyes and the cheeks correct? The width of the mouth. Those are the things that really create a likeness faster than anything else. Because you know, you don't have x-ray vision. You can't see a hundred yards away, but we know that who that is automatically. What'd you mix there? What did I mix there? Yeah, what colors? That was yellow ochre and umber. Raw umber? Yeah, just a dirty brown is really, if you think about it, that's really what it is, it's a dirty brown. 
black and yellow will do the same thing. <laughs> yeah. When I say yellow, I mean yellow ochre, of course. I just had this on my palette. And I can bring that up a little. See, I don't want to bring it up with white yet. I haven't even touched the white. Now I'm going to touch the white just to see how this goes. It's too much. Okay, now I'm gonna start inching up on value. So I'm gonna start with the neck because it's always a safe place to start. <laughs> I can nudge up there. And so I'm gonna use transparent oxide red and yellow, and you'll see it gives you a beautiful orange. A little, just a tiny touch of yellow. That's not enough. Let's go up a little bit more. Oh, that's pretty good. See, lips are a little too low. Thank you. 
I can see that that cools as it's starting to turn. So I might just take that little bit of umber. We'll turn that into the shadow there as well. Just letting you know, we've got 34 participants. Well, hello, everybody. And it's not even a blizzard somewhere. There's things to be doing besides this. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Yeah, for all of us, especially in Atlanta and the South, the weather, it feels like spring has sprung. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My wife are debating about going to the beach today as soon as we finish with our workshops. <laughs> not that, it's not that warm, is it? It is here. <laughs> for, yeah, all you, in, for all you snowbirds, I'm sorry. <laughs> you're in Savannah, huh? Yeah. It is beautiful today. I think we're supposed to get rain tomorrow. You guys are supposed to get rain today or tomorrow too, right? Yes, yes. Well, that's why you're here. Those are the best days to paint when it's nice and rainy outside. You don't feel guilty just letting yourself paint, right? <laughs> As you can see, I'm sneaking up on the values. I'm not trying to do anything too much. Just playing with the shape language, mostly with this transparent oxide red, a little bit of white, and then some yellow ochre to keep it warm. I always want to, uh, probably for the skin tone, air on the side of warmth. This, this is always one of the hardest parts to paint. This real subtle bony transition. And one of the things when you're painting a nose especially, save the highlights. Try not to paint around the shape of that highlight you'd see in her face you will always mess it up. It makes, then it'll make it look like it's carved out of stone instead of super soft flesh. Highlights will be the last thing we paint. I have a comment from Lisa Swift. She says, thank you for doing this. I am a SCAD alumni from 1995 before oh. we knew what the internet was. <laughs> yeah, before any of us knew what the internet was back in 1995. Well, 
Nice to know you, at least virtually. Hopefully we'll get to meet each other one of these days in person. We've had several people join and just maybe you can just say what your flesh colors are again. Sure, everybody. Uh, the flesh colors I'm using today, primarily I'm keeping in the warms are, of course, white. And then I have yellow ochre, transparent oxide red. That makes a really nice earthy orange color. And then to kill it, I gave a number of different options. Umber for our underpainting will do it because it'll cool things down. Umber is a nice dirty, uh, it's really a deep yellow is what it is, but it creates a nice earthy uh, gray if you mix it with white. The best color to mix with any of these is an ultramarine blue. It's kind of a purpley reddish blue, but it really works well since it's already on the red range it mixes well with all these other uh, very warm colors to bring it down. Black will work as well. Just don't go too heavy on the black. Anything you go with too heavy on the black or too heavy on the white and your colors start looking chalky. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons most of us will look at our paintings and we're like, why it just looks so dead. And it's because we're using white or black too much. Remember yellow, on the value scale, and you guys can see it there just by tilt my, maybe I should do that anyway so you guys can see what I'm working with. The uh, yellow ochre is still pretty high on the value scale for most of what we're working on. So if I just take it just to show you, let me grab a brush here. I just take pure yellow and put it up there on the skin, you'll see. That did pretty well. It, li it lights things up pretty well. So try not to get into the whites too, too early. Is there a particular brand of paint you prefer? Oh, good question. Uh, I meant to bring that up earlier. I've painted with all of them. Uh, I just saw my good friend Frank Ordaz was being highlighted by Dick Blick this weekend or this week for some of his work. And he's using Utrecht paints. I like Utrecht. I've used Utrecht for years and years and years and years and years. Uh, what you'll find is pretty much the brands themselves are quite good these days, uh, but there are still differences. For me, the most consistent out of the two, as far as its pliability, 
It's not too thin and oily or it's not too thick and dry. It's Gamblin. They've done a great job of just being able to keep everything consistent across the board. That being said, I'm using Gamblin White, Gamblin Yellow, uh, Gamblin Ultramarine Blue, and then I'm using uh, Rembrandt's Transparent Oxide Red. So you just start finding colors you like because you like the particular color. Yeah, I forgot what I was doing. <laughs> Let that paint dry. What you'll see me doing from time to time is just grabbing my brush and making sure that I've soaked up out of the, the spirits out of it to try to make it more of a stiffer mix. As you can see, I'm keeping all the values pretty darker than they really are at this point, because I'll build up to the whites. It allows me to keep the color more pure. And philosophically, I think it, it reflects uh, many ways the way light, if you think of what light does to an object, how it illuminates the object and brings more detail to it, the shadows will stay kind of sketchy and uh, nebulous. And so I try to paint that way as well. Step that down right there on that transition. The hardest part about those lips is our knowledge. We think we see a hard line, and so we want to draw a hard line, but lips aren't hard. You know, they're so soft and kissable, and you know, they're so pliable, and so you have to really think of them as soft. And the way to do that is really make those transitions barely noticeable. What you might notice if we had a better camera is that I'm really trying to get those transitions where things start turning. That's where I'm trying to make them the warmest. And that turning light, uh, we might call it the terminator shadow. When uh, the light starts turning, it's usually where the light is its warmest, it's, especially when it's going through translucent skin. So I would almost always err on it being warmer than cooler.
I don't really have a red on my palette. So I'm just using the warmest red I have, which is the transparent oxide red for those lips. Then I'll go yellow. What other colors would you use for your flesh if you added them? Oh, it uh, stays pretty much basically the same. I'll use the full palette of colors whenever I need to. Uh, if it's an outdoor scene, I really want to have that beautiful, what I think of as a reflected blue lights. I'll bring, you know, King's blue, which is really nothing more than lizard and crimson and uh, ultramarine blue with white. And it'll bring it really high into the chromatic era. Those lips look a little weird to me. I'm just gonna have to chisel those away a little bit. Well, I'm not gonna be happy. Getting a really soft brush here, dry brush too. So I can just kill that a little bit. Too many brushes in my hand. <laughs> Let's 
Mike, someone just asked me uh, what your preferences were on brushes, bristle or synthetic? Uh, I don't really like synthetic uh, unless I, I have a special need for them. I prefer the, uh, I like hog hair's bristle for most things. And then right now I'm using one of the Rosemary and Company Badger hair brushes. Issa Bay makes a really good set of uh, Badger hair brushes as well. They're a nice soft blend, uh, but for the most part, hog's hair bristle does most of what I need it to until the details come in. Again, I've used every kind of brush that's out there. Uh, when I need, uh, I'm doing concept work from time to time, or if I'm painting anything that really needs those hard edges, that's when a synthetic brush for me works fine because then I can get those super hard edges I might be after, for instance, buildings, or if I'm painting steel or I'm painting some sort of special effect, then I'll use a synthetic brush. Synthetic brushes feel to me kind of plasticky. So they almost make it feel like I'm painting with a really fine palette knife. Not happy with that transition yet. Sorry, guys. Just pat that in and paint it back out again. This is what I was talking about the fixing, the back and the forth, the back and the forth. It forces you to do things that you don't plan on doing. And it's nice to know that John Singer Sargent had to go through the same trouble. <laughs> he made it look effortless, like he, you know, put it down with one brush stroke, but he was tend to painting a lot of little strokes and little mixes, and then would finally put that last little stroke in the end. using just a dry brush to knock down some of those edges of the paint. I'm getting a lot of glare from where I am, so I'm trying to knock some of those down. I guess I should attack the eyes now. I've been waiting on those, right? Thank you. 
I'm not painting with anything darker than an umber right now. It's still warm because there's no mixture of white. I don't want to, I would never want to get too much, anything black around the eyes. Even if she's wearing heavy makeup, I wouldn't do that unless it just needed as a glaze or something. Can you guys hear my wife? <laughs> I hear her talking to her students. And when you're painting those whites of the eyes, especially, you can't really go wrong if you paint everything a little bit pink to begin with or warm. They tend to be cooler than anything else on the face, but it's, they're making contact with so much skin, those little sclera of the eye, everything else around there. Uh, tends to be very warm, except for the highlights. The highlights will be cool, but when you're coming up on everything, tend to keep it warm. Transition. Some of that transition was painting it coming in underneath. It was way too gray, so I had to paint it out. Now I'll go back in with the, my yellow again. It's always better to err on the caution of making things too soft than making things too hard. Oh, I'm sorry. Was I in your way? You guys just tell me if I'm in the way or blocking anything. From... I wish I could get the camera up closer. I'm so sorry, guys.
get my big makeup brush here again and
tickle that transition. A nice dry brush. She's starting to look at us. Starting to notice me from across the room. Isn't that right? <laughs> the way I set the lighting up is also something you guys might be interested in. This is known as Rembrandt lighting. And it's some of the simplest lighting to set up really. Uh, it's a single light source for the most part. And it has a cover over it. In this case, I think I was showing, this was a student. Uh, and so this is a student demonstration where all this started from. I just took one of my regular lights. I, I like to use the LED floodlights because they're a good bright white. I mean, uh, it's about 4,500 Kelvins. You can get them a little bit brighter, but that's a nice one. And then I also will hook it up to a very cheap dimmer. Just one of those little $5 dimmers so I can plug everything into that. And I can adjust the value of the light. And then what I did, rather, it still has, you can see a really nice highlight on there, but it's got a sheet of tracing paper over it. Nothing more than that, just to dull it and diffuse it a little bit more than that. So it's pretty high. It's about another foot and a half above her head. You can see how high it is. It's coming in uh, from a top right angle and then a really strong shadow. And then as far as background, that is a pretty warm gray uh, and has no light on it whatsoever. So we can see that the only fill light we're getting at all in our light source is bounced up from her skin and a little coming from this gray. Now, if I need some in the shadows, I might use a white card or even a gray card or a warm card, like a piece of cardboard will bounce that warm light back into her. And that's the easiest way to do it. That's some of the nicest light, the three quarter angle. So we see the bone structure, everything of her face is in the light. Things start turning away from the shadows. It's one of the easiest lights to set up and one of the easiest lights to paint from too. Some of the hardest light, I think we all agree, is that really flat north light or daylight when you're outside on a gray day. And just so much modeling going on, there's very little transition between shadows. It makes it really difficult to get all those subtleties. Norman Rockwell loved that north light coming from the studio. And some of that's so difficult to model because there are no real deep shadows unless you have, you control the north light and really limited its scope on the model. And when it comes to modeling my lights or my model, I should say when it comes to lighting my models, I won't make any decisions till I meet my model. Uh, this kind of what we would almost think of as harsh Rembrandt lighting works really well with beautiful young people because there's no flaws anyway, right? With uh, older, yeah. yeah, with older people, if there's a lot of wrinkles, that's when I might use a lot more fill. And even then, I use my artistic license to ceremoniously take out I we never paint wrinkles that's one of the rules you never paint wrinkles you paint folds but you never paint wrinkles because wrinkles are really surface more than they are structural and they have less to do with any kind of identity also uh when I meet my models I can tell right away if they'll be good as sitting models or if they need to be standing models. Men in suits never look very good seated if there's any kind of girth because the folds of the jackets always look a little un uncumbersome. So almost always we'll have them standing. But a very thin man in a suit looks great when it's all the folds really give angular shapes 
that looks really good. So I can make a lot more mo uh, choices then. Mike, it's, um, it's about a quarter till three and we okay. got a little late start. Do you want to go over or you, you want to be done sure. by three? I can go a little over. I mean, I'm having fun. We're making progress. So uh, we can go a little bit longer and I'm getting pretty good into where I would like her to be as an underpainting, not completely, but where I would like her to be as an underpainting is getting close. I would almost leave just so you guys would know. And I guess I should finish some of those shadows up a little bit more, but I don't want to put too much into the shadows, but before I would leave, I, I wouldn't leave them this unfinished. I would have to finish the shadow. I would almost rather leave the lights unfinished than the shadows unfinished. Does that make sense? Yes. Only because they're so structural and they're going to stay thin. And I want the shadows to stay thin. That transparent kind of translucent kind of quality of the shadow. So I'll start doing that a little bit more to find some of those. Got another question for you. Sure. From Lisa Swift it says, "What are your go-to colors for shadow, midtones, highlights of blonde hair versus dark brown hair?" Oh, good. Okay, now blonde hair, as we know, it's uh, we think of it as straw more than anything. So uh, you can get a lot of variation very quickly for blonde hair if you use umber, yellow ochre, and white. And then you could, cause it'll have, and then if you have a little bit of burnt sienna or a transparent oxide red for those warmer parts of the blonde hair, blonde hair tends to reflect cool colors, but the shadows tend to be warm of a blonde headed person. That's generalities. You know, it's not, there's always uh, changes there. She, this lady here, or young lady is a, what we think of as a very light brunette, uh, honey blonde, maybe at one time in her childhood. Uh, and believe it or not, yellow ochre and black make a great, that slightly greenish color that you see blonde hair turn when it's reflecting blues because it's in the shadow, but it's still reflecting blues. So it turns a little green. And a lot of people have thought blonde hair to be hard to paint. It's, I don't know if I get just got lucky. I found uh, blonde hair to be fairly easy to paint with those earthy colors. She said blonde hair versus dark brown hair. So how would okay. you do that different? Okay, so the brown hair it would uh, definitely be my burnt sienna and ultramarine blue. And then for the highlights, again, depending on whether the light is gonna be warm or cool, uh, just an umber with white will do it as well, but it needs to be a little bit on the warm side because you're seeing through hair as much as anything else. So hair is very trans, if you think hair as transparent, uh, but the darkest darks for dark brown hair, probably burnt sienna or transparent oxide red and ultramarine blue. Okay. Black hair is the hardest, really, when you think about it, because black is, what is black? Black, rarely do we ever see hair that's really solid black. We see it as really super dark, 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 dark brown, <laughs> almost. And then occasionally you'll see, when you see someone with black hair, it's like that cold jet black. Uh, Elvis, you know, black. <laughs> that's when you're going to get some, a lot of those blues being reflected back into the hair.
It's these transitions are always the thing that most key in the underpainting stage, I think. Because uh, my students have heard me say this so often, it's better to leave a painting soft than it is to keep a painting hard. If you know you're gonna leave a painting, you have to leave in 15 minutes, it's time to, I would start softening up. Any edge that you're just not sure of, I would just go ahead and make it softer because it's so much easier to come back and make that edge hard later than it would be to take an edge that dries hard and try to soften that layer. That is so difficult because that paint, especially we want to keep that transparency quality of it. It just wants to get, we want to keep it translucent. It's really difficult to soften that up later. Are you, are you still considering this an underpainting? Yeah, I would. It'll be a, it's a colored underpainting instead of a, uh, just a monochromatic underpainting. But it's, I would still consider this an underpainting. I would take this to finish later with glazes and it, I would call the second skin. Will you finish this later? No, I mean, not today, but probably it's one of those things that it'll, I won't be able to stand it if it if it's not finished <laughs> well I was just hoping if you did you could maybe send us a picture of it so that we could sure. show it absolutely I'd like to see it okay yeah now I'm just cleaning edges up I think you guys can see me doing that it's all like I said there's no <laughs> it's not finished until it's finished and it's always an adjustment it seems like would you let it dry before you went any further? Uh, oh, yeah, 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 completely. I'll let it dry completely for two reasons. For one, I don't mind being abusive to it if I need to later. It'll be dry so I can go back in, I can rub things off. I don't, I won't consider this too precious. It's there as a foundation, but the colors will work really well for me. And what I'll probably do, like I might as well do it for you guys now. I will probably just come through here, especially some of these things. I'll just let those edges get lost. Because I want that wispiness of the hair where things just kind of get lost in the shadows. So I'll leave that there. And then I haven't really finished any of the nose at all yet. And so I would probably want to soften even that up. If I left it today, I would want to soften it before I did so. I think most of us who have painted with any kind of glazing also know that getting those super subtleties where you get that nuance of you know rosy cheeks and it's so much easier to do sometimes when the paint is dry and you can come in as a translucent glaze. As what do you make your what do you make your glaze with? I'll do this. I'll just paint the whole painting again, just really thin. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, only when it needs on the third skin, what I call the third paint over, might I put any medium and a little hints of thin translucent glazes. And it depends on the red. Do I want her cheeks to have a cool red color? I'll use alizarin crimson. If I want them to have a warm red color, I'll probably use this transparent oxide red again. Occasionally I'll use uh, like a, 
cad red if I want the lips to be really bright or something, but that's very subtle. It doesn't glaze well. That's the reason being. Usually you want something that glazes well. Someone asked, how long does it take to dry before you can go back and add and rub off glazes safely? Well, I can probably give it two to three days. One of the, oh, that's another thing I wanted to bring up also today. Being an illustrator so much of my career, I've always had to work under a deadline. And so one of the things that's really helped me is if I were going to leave this tonight and say I were finished with it right now, I would set up a little lamp in front of it with about a 40 watt bulb. And I would just leave it there overnight. And it's usually dry enough to paint on the next day. That's a good tip. Yeah, and it's not baking the paint. People say, is it baking the paint? No, it's not baking the paint. All it is is just helping the paint to, uh, the oils to evaporate more and just a little bit faster. That's all it's doing. It's really just speeding up the evaporation process. And if you've used any liquid at all, like my mediums today, as far as medium, is very little. I don't need much because the paint has medium in it to the point. But I've got a little bit of walnut oil mixed with just a little bit of uh, liquid. And I usually mix it over here on the side part of the palette, just a little glob. And then I just kind of dip into that from time to time, just enough to be in the paint. It doesn't need to be much more than that. I don't want to thin my paint too much to, to uh, start any cracking. But in this point, everything's so wet into wet and the wet on the first base, you don't have to worry about cracking here. That's why if we work in the fat over lean method, every subsequent layer that I paint over this will have more medium in it. That's why it'll be translucent. And if it's gonna be that thin, it needs something to bind that together. So it's gonna to have to be something like uh, a walnut oil, liquid, you know, linseed oil, stand oil mixture. We've gotten away from Daymar varnish simply because we're not using turpentine anymore. Well, if you're not using turpentine, you can't really use a Daymar varnish. You can use some of the new uh, Gamlin Daymar varnishes, but there's, they're really not Daymar varnished like what we're thinking of. Uh, because Gamsol is a petroleum distillate. So it needs something that works with that. That's why an alkyd base such as Liquin, or Galkid, I think that's the other brand name. Those tend to work pretty well. Yeah, if I were gonna do this, and I won't put the highlight today at all on her nose, because I would if I, you know, for painting purposes, but if it were an a finished painting, but I'm not going to finish this today. One of the things I do want to soften around here. You can see that needs some adjustment on it. Just get my, I call it my little makeup brush out. I always keep one that's it's hard to paint with anymore because it's just gotten so soft or so spread out, but it makes a really good blender. <laughs> so I rarely throw any uh, brushes away. I'll carve them down if they get really stiff and I'll use them for pointers or something else, but it's hard for a brush not to have some sort of purpose. Let me dry this out real quick. Okay, I'm gonna blend this white of the eye in a little bit. Want that soft edge so I can come back into it. Yeah, I was talking with the students the other day. Uh, just about workloads and schedules. Uh, I was working on a series of advertisements and I had uh, three assistants, two other assistants working with me at the time. 
And we were literally on this one deadline working around the clock, 24 hour shifts, just so we could get these nine paintings done within a two week period. Yeah. It was brutal, but we got it done. <laughs> what size painting? I think the one in that one, the largest in that series was five feet by three feet. It was a giant, uh, it was a giant Casbah bar scene. So it had like 30 people in it and uh, architectural interests and things as much as going on. A lot of curtains and uh, had uh, fancy Moroccan tile work going on. So it was just a, it was a mess. When you paint that large, what, what are you painting on? Uh, at that time, they were all stretched canvases. And depending on how it's going to be reproduced, I knew that all those paintings were going to be bought by the client. So I wanted to make sure they were presented well afterwards. I've been able to sell a lot of my original artwork to the clients because once they're not used to seeing oil paintings as an illustration. So once they would see them, they would almost want to always buy them for their headquarters. So it's another way of making extra income from the artwork. Have you painted on any kind of boards, like for something large? Yes, I have. Uh, and today I'm working on one of those panels. Now, and I've and stretched work before you could really glue things well. Uh, it was always a problem. And rather than glue them, I've had better luck waxing an image or a canvas onto a hard, stiff board using the old beeswax method and then pressing and ironing it in. And that holds it really well to the surface. And should you ever need to peel it away again, all you have to do is heat it and you can pull it back again. Uh, but yes, usually what I'll do, if it needs to be really large, uh, some of the paintings at the state capitol, though, those are all on heavy duty stretcher bar frames. The, the stretcher bars themselves have a mechanism built in that allows me to go in and restretch so it'll tighten it up. And there's a nice inch and a half a rabbit around the frame. So if I stretch it that much, it'll still be able to stretch inside the frame as well. I'm trying to see where it needs to be done now. I'm just going to use umber and white. Let's see what this looks like. I had another question that says, have you found that clients value stretch canvas as opposed to other substrates? Uh, not really. I think uh, stretch canvases are fine. They really are. The problem is, I think we all know, is if it gets too large, the canvas wants to buckle or, or it could uh, in many ways sometimes sag if it's too large. And so those cause problems. Of course, it's easy to poke a hole through one of those as well. I'd say the safest thing you can use these days are these Raymar panels. And the reason being is because they're so stable that you're never gonna have shrinkage in any discernible way for the canvas panels themselves. Whereas stretch canvas, you know, depending, because people hang their pictures in all kinds of weird places. If you hang it over the fireplace, that dry heat over time might cause it to start wrinkling and cr cracking. Uh, or one of my heroes had done these large uh, murals at the state capitol. Never been a problem because the capitol building there at that time didn't have any windows up in the clerestories. Well, they added a new dome to the capitol and now they had all these little clerestories and they're all these little spots. So those spotlights would travel across the murals little by little each day. So that's time, every time the sun would hit it, it would heat up and it would cool down. Then it would heat up and cool down. And, and every time that 
light pattern would uh, travel across. They started noticing they'd been up there almost 80 years, no problem. And then within five years after them putting the new uh, domes in the dome in there with all those little clerestory windows, they started getting cracking on the painting. So heat, that you know, direct sunlight, never a good thing for a painting, especially an oil painting. And then varnishing a painting is always something that needs to be done. It's hard because most of the time our clients want the paintings before they can be varnished. I can't blame them. A retouch varnish works fairly well. Uh, liquid, if you paint with liquid, you can put a little liquid coat over the varnish. And then some of these new modern varnishes let you varnish or temporary varnish over the painting, you know, once it's at least surface dry. Mike, it's about five after three, and I'm just gonna let you go until you you want to stop. Okay, I'll give you it's another 10 minutes. I, once I get on the eyes, it's almost always hypnotic, right? Any other questions in before I let you guys go and get back to your beautiful Saturdays? <laughs> I've read all that I've, we've got so far. Anybody else got a question? She's starting to look at us, guys. Is she looking at you yet? Let me see here. Be beautiful. She's starting to, yeah. Is this somebody you know, the model? She's a former student. And so... Uh, She's been painted so many times. I gave her a couple of copies of this already <laughs> in the past just for her to keep. But I know most of, most people are more interested in painting women than they are men. So I knew this would be a good place to start. And it's a simple one. You know, I like it because as a teaching tool, it's a fairly simple color palette. So it's not too complicated with all a lot of pastels or a lot of cools and then some greens get reflected into the shadows. This is a fairly easy color palette. And when I'm teaching students, especially in the beginning stages, keep the palette simple, very few colors. And just think about value more than anything else. And you'll start getting a feel for how the paint feels and how it blends and that dark to light, you know, soft to hard uh, transitions. That'll make things a lot easier for you. Just think about those things first. Don't worry too much about those subtle nuances of color. Think about the values first. Just start getting yourself used to painting. Can't leave yet without structuring that nose in a little bit. And it's so subtle. That's why I've been leaving it alone for the most part.
it looks like or sounds like we're starting to lose people so i can say goodbye to everybody. yeah we, we've lost a few okay. there's still still a bunch watching them still as hardcore people in there right <laughs> let's give you five more minutes you want to close it up and say anything you okay. want to share well uh i will continue and when i do paint on it some more i will continue to record it for you guys just to make sure that you see the rest of what i see and i'll share that with you and send it to you your email that you can uh, share with anybody else that'd be awesome okay yeah. be more than happy to and uh, if you guys have requests or things you would like to see in the future we'll try to put something else together in the future that's great i'm getting a lot of thank yous in the chat box you're awfully welcome. I really appreciate being here. I can't wait to get to meet everybody. This is one of the big reason I joined the Atlanta Portrait Society so I could get to know, uh, being from Oklahoma, I'm, I know almost everybody in the state of Oklahoma if they were an artist at one time or another. So I just miss uh, hanging out with all my artistic friends. And so I can't wait to get to meet all of us as a group whenever we can finally all get back together. I was going to say, we all miss it too. <laughs> we all miss meeting together. I'm sure. I'm very sure. So you guys have a great weekend, okay? Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, yeah, I look better when you can't see me at all. So I look much better that yeah. way. <laughs> That's beautiful. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend. You too. Thank you.